Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today in our 475th episode, we're starting a special two-part series on ichnofossils. Also known as trace fossils. Yes, basically any fossil that isn't an actual physical part of an animal, or in our case, a dinosaur. Yes, it's the things that the dinosaurs left behind. It could be a fossilized track. It could be a coprolite or a bromolite or a gastrolith. Things that they digested and then pooped or vomited out. Yep. Could be a burrow, Mm -hmm. all sorts of different things. And they tell you a lot about how dinosaurs behaved in ways that a lot of times just bones alone can't. And in addition to ichnofossils, we also have dinosaur of the day, Talon Kauen, and of course, a fun fact, which I believe is also about ichnofossils. Yep. But Sabrina's doing almost all of the talking, so I'm going to be surprised. (laughs) You're really going to teach me about ichnofossils. (laughs) I learned a lot myself researching these episodes. Mm Mm-hmm. But before we get into all of that, as always, we want to thank some of our patrons. And this week, we'd like to thank Reggie, Lazy Dump Truck, Dino Mo, John, Devin, Linda, Geraldine, It's Devin Baby, Thieving Raptor Lorenzo, and Amato Titan. Thank you so much for being part of our Dino It All community. And this way, we get to do fun stuff like two-parter episodes. Yes, because generally speaking, if you have an episode titled Ichno Fossils, it might not be the thing that a ton of non-dinosaur fans would click on, so we might have to go for a more clickbaity general audience topic. But thanks to our patrons, we don't have to worry as much about that because we know that you're into this kind of stuff (laughs) And, and we don't have to make everything really sensationalistic. Yes, though I don't know if the title of this episode will end up being Ichnofossils. Yeah, we don't decide till the last second. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not going to be like, you won't believe this amazing hack of how to learn about dinosaurs. Mm, I see. <laughs> Although maybe it should be. Well, anyway, dinosaurs, as we were saying, they left behind more than their bones. Like they literally left behind their marks because there are traces of them everywhere. Tracks trails. Trails are like tracks, but they're more irregular. They're left by, say, snails or worms crawling, by jellyfish dragging tentacles, or markings left by crustaceans or sea urchins, for example, because trace fossils can are made by more than just dinosaurs. They're made by all sorts of organisms. But there's also burrows, nests, eggs, tooth marks, and even poop and vomit. So all of these things, they're known as ichnofossils or trace fossils, and they give us clues into how, in our case, we'll be talking about how dinosaurs lived and how they behaved. Scientists study these traces, and it's known as ichnology. And again, it's not just dinosaurs. It could be all kinds of organisms. Even trilobites, crabs, centipedes, millipedes, worms, and more can leave evidence. Yeah, sometimes they leave the evidence on dinosaur bones, too, mm-hmm. because ichnology includes <laughs> traces left on bones. So there's a there's some overlap between what the bones can tell us and what ichnology can tell us, because sometimes the ichnology is part of the bone. Yes, yeah. Like, there have been papers we've talked about of beetle borings in dinosaur bones. Mm-hmm. But in that case, it's usually telling us more about the beetles <laughs> than it is about the dinosaurs. I can tell you a little bit about where the dinosaur lived, too. That's true, yeah. So there are a lot of sources that I went through for this two-part episode. This was something I ended up researching over almost a couple months. (laughs) I did not expect to dive this deep, go down this far on Erected Romeus Burrow, which we'll be talking about, incidentally. (laughs) And it's a trace fossil right there. Yep. But there were a few especially good sources for getting started on ichnology if you wanted to also dive deep. There's the book Trace Fossils, Concepts, Problems, Prospects edited by William Miller III. Also the book Trace Fossils as Indicators of Sedimentary Environments, edited by Dirk Nost and Richard G. Bromley, which has a good intro and includes the history of the study of ichnofossils. There's the book Ignology, Organism Substrate Interactions in Space and Time by Louis A. Boutois and M. Gabriella Mangano, which also has a good intro on what ichnology is. 
And there's the book Dinosaurs Without Bones by Anthony J. Martin, which talks about the traces dinosaurs specifically left behind and was probably my first introduction to acknology because I read that book when we first started this podcast and we interviewed Anthony way back in episode two, which maybe doesn't seem so far way back because we recently remastered that episode. Hmm. We've also talked a lot about acknology discoveries and scientific studies over the years, so We'll be revisiting and highlighting a few throughout these next couple episodes, but don't worry, we're also talking about some new papers too. As a quick note, acknology includes neo-acknology, which is the study of modern traces, and paleo-acknology, which is the study of trace fossils. Unfortunately, it's hard to compare trace fossils with modern traces, because I know a lot of times we talk about you when studying dinosaurs to figure out what happened with them or what was going on with them, you compare to modern animals, but you can't quite do that with trace fossils is that because there there were different animals leaving the thing so a boar in a bone like you were talking about with a beetle might be a type of beetle that's now extinct or something it's because a lot of times you don't know what animal left behind that trace fossil oh i see but with modern technology you like watch the animal do it mm-hmm. and then you know exactly what made it gotcha so we will be focusing on paleo technology and of course specifically dinosaurs So what is ichnology? Again, animals leave traces, and they leave these telltale signs in the ground like tracks or burrows. These are known as bioturbation structures. (laughs) They also leave traces with their droppings like coprolites. These are known as biodeposition structures. Makes sense. They're they're depositing. Mm -hmm. (laughs) There's marks that they leave like borings or drill holes. Those are known as bioerosion structures. And then there's even structures that they create, and those are known as biostratification structures. Ah. One example of a biostratification structure are stromatolites. These are layered sedimentary formations created mainly by microorganisms like cyanobacteria, and they produced adhesive compounds that cemented materials to form these microbial mats. Sometimes they're towers, sometimes they look more flat, they come in all kinds of shapes and sizes. I suppose another one would be a nest, right? That would also count as a biostratification structure because mm. you're building a little thing. Yeah. Although if the nest is made out of twigs or if it's made out of compost, like a lot of dinosaurs, there's not going to be anything left. But maybe I have seen some fossils where they think kind of like a footprint, mm-hmm. the shape of the dirt that's been smushed into the shape of a nest and then with the eggs laying in it, they think that is the original nest shape in the rock. Oh, that's cool. Other than that, though, I don't think dinosaurs did a ton of building. Like they didn't make giant ant hills. Yeah. They didn't really produce anything with their in colonies (laughs) like bacteria do. Right. They mostly, I think it's burrows. Yeah. Also teeth marks and of course the droppings. Yep. Now, ichnology is not all cut and dry. Like I said, it's very difficult to figure out which animal produced a trace fossil because from the trace fossil, we only know the behavior of the animal that made it. We know nothing, well, we know very little about the animal itself. Yeah, unless I've heard it described, the animal doesn't usually die at the end of a trackway. Mm -hmm. Although there are rare occasions where there is like a dead animal with a foot around the right size that sort of matches. Yeah. Or in the case of the Erectodromaeus burrow, (laughs) where they were literally three specimens found together in a burrow. Yes. And then the trick is noticing that they're in the burrow. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Because usually if there's an animal there, that's the exciting thing you focus on and you might miss the more subtle trace fossil that's right there with it. I guess in the case of nests too, you sometimes know because I assume an eggshell would probably count as an ichno fossil. It depends. If there's an embryo in the egg, then no. Oh, interesting. So if you have a mixture of one with an embryo and those without embryos, then the one with the embryo, which isn't technically an ichno fossil, will tell you that the other ichno fossils were probably from that same species. Yeah, so it can get complicated, although not impossible to figure out who made what. But what adds to this complexity is that the same animal may make more than one ichnotaxin, like different tracks and burrows, for example, or more than one animal can make the same ichnotaxin, like if they make similar looking tracks or burrows. Mm -hmm. We should mention too, an ichnotaxin is like the name we give to a type of track. Yes. 
It's just like how dinosaurs have names. Ichno or trace fossils have names and they are there's ichnotaxons and ichnospecies. Mm hmm. Like one really famous one is Ubrantes. That's the track that you see al along a lot of the northeastern U.S. Mm -hmm. and is a state fossil in a couple spots because it's that three-toed print and a lot of theropod tracks basically get lumped into Ubrantes. Mm -hmm. But we don't know which specific theropod made that track. Yeah, we still don't. We've <laughs> known about these tracks for well over 100 years and we're still like, eh, maybe it's something like a Dilophosaurus. I don't know. The more simple a trace fossil is, the harder it is to figure out which animal made it. For example, multiple types of insects or spiders can make simple burrows. But if the trace fossil is more complex, it's a little easier to figure out what made it. And also keep in mind that multiple animals may work together to create a single structure, like a nest. Trace fossils must represent evidence of an animal or organism's behavior. That's what makes them a trace fossil. So what ichnology is not? Well, pseudofossils are not trace fossils. And pseudofossils are objects, marks, or impressions that might look like fossils. And one example are concretions, those hard, solid masses that come in many shapes, like lumpy, oval, disc, and more. Why is ichnology important? We can only learn so much from bones, and studying trace fossils helps give us more of the story. It brings together a mix of sciences, including paleontology, biology, sedimentology. Trace fossils, they represent an animal interacting with something. The ground, plants, even other animals. They can tell us how an animal moved. Did they walk? Did they crawl, run, swim? We can learn where they lived, details about breeding and nesting and maybe hibernating, how and what they fed on. If it was a predator, what was its pace when it was chasing something? Or how did a prey animal, if it was a prey animal, act after an attack? So again, ichnofossils represent behaviors, and what the animal wants to do determines how it moves. Like, it moves differently if it's foraging for food versus migrating or reproducing or hunting or avoiding predators. For example, if it's foraging, the animal will likely try to conserve energy by not traveling too far for the food, or it'll go somewhere to eat to avoid competition or risk getting preyed upon. In addition to behaviors, though, trace fossils help show what the environment was like. Was there environmental stress? Were the animals in marine environments, for example? There are ichnofaces. These are assemblages of trace fossils that occur repeatedly in time and space, and by documenting and researching changes in them, scientists can interpret changes in the environment. Sometimes trace fossils can be used as index fossils and help date the rocks where they're found. One example is the Treptichnus trace fossil. It's a preserved burrow, and it's the earliest known complex trace fossil from about 542 million years ago, and it helps us define the beginning of the Cambrian. That's a cool one. Yeah. And if you see an increase in diversity of trace fossils, that helps show evolution and how things are changing. So there's a lot we can learn. That's a good point, too, with the Cambrian, because at the beginning of the Cambrian, there weren't a lot of animals that fossilized. <laughs> mm -hmm. Most of them were still soft until the Cambrian explosion. So, But they still left marks. Exactly. Like you were talking about worms leaving burrows. You can find those going way back, whereas... Finding an actual worm fossil is pretty difficult. <laughs> mm -hmm. In terms of how trace fossils get preserved, they're almost always in situ in their original place. And again, trace fossils, they're not once living things, but they are subject to the same physical and chemical processes as body or bone fossils. And that means that they can also change over time depending on how they're preserved or fossilized. We see this in tracks a lot. Sometimes things get broken apart. Trace fossils have been recognized since prehistoric times. That makes sense because body fossils have also been recognized for a long time. There's some evidence that humans selectively collected mollusks with trace fossils and used them as decorations or jewelry. These bio-eroded Miocene mollusks have been found in the cultural layers of the Czech Republic. They're from about 29,000 to 24,000 years ago. That's some early jewelry. Mm-hmm. Then there's Marala. To name just one more example, I think this might be your favorite example, Garrett. It's the mythical being known as the lawgiver who created codes of conduct. This is of the Aboriginal Australian Dreamtime. And while moving through the song cycle from south to north and in and out of the sea, 
Morale left behind three-toed tracks, now known as Megalosaurus brumensis, the big lizard foot of broom, which is found in Australia. And these are theropod tracks. I've heard... It's the emu man. Yes, I was going to say, I've heard that called the emu man. I have never heard the actual proper noun name for Morala before. That's really cool. Yeah. Yeah, I love that one. That people went out and they saw these huge tracks in the ground and they had three toes and they knew what emu tracks look like and they logically put together it must have been a huge emu like foot that mm-hmm. made this and it's also cool that they were clever enough to think well just because his foot looked like an emu foot doesn't mean it was just a huge emu mm-hmm. and they came up with a different type of animal or a different a person on top and an emu on the bottom basically but you know now we know that they were from dinosaurs but i, I really like that that they were sort of going down that path already mhm There's other people and naturalists in the 1500s and 1600s study trace fossils. Interestingly, Leonardo da Vinci has been called the father of ichnology, but this is well before the term ichnology was coined. He studied many fossils, including mollusk shells and corals, and many had signs of borings. And then he compared modern organisms to fossils and showed a link between trace fossils and body fossils. He also used traces of worms as a tool to show the marine origin of sedimentary layers in the Apennine Mountains in Italy. Ichnology as we know it today has been studied for about 200 years. Vertebrate ichnology started first, which maybe isn't surprising. Invertebrate ichnology developed separately. Many invertebrate traces were first thought to be fossil algae. But in the vertebrate ichnology world, Henry Duncan discovered footprints in Scotland dating back to the Permian, and in 1828, William Buckland compared these Scottish fossil tracks with tracks that he made. He had a living pond turtle and land tortoise make tracks on soft mud, clay, and unbaked pie crust, and concluded the fossil track was made by a land tortoise. Tortoises, however, didn't evolve until much later, so most likely the tracks were actually made by a therapsid. But these are early days. I love the idea of a tortoise walking on an unbaked pie crust (laughs) as a scientific experiment. That's delightful. (laughs) William Jardine coined the term ichnology in 1851, and ichnology means study of tracks. Research around ichnology got way bigger in the 1960s, and it has been growing. We do talk a fair amount about ichnology papers on this show when I was going through past episodes i had more than i needed for these episodes (laughs) yeah yeah it makes sense that it took a while to be focused on because if you're in the early days and you're starting to find these bones and you're like what are these bones your first instinct is going to be to find more bones and try to see what the full animal looks like Mm -hmm. and then once you find a lot of the full animals then you want to learn stuff about how they behaved but at first if you're just collecting tracks or collecting marks on things It's not as interesting if you don't have an idea about what the body of the animal looked like. Mm -hmm. And I think in a lot of cases, the bones are easier to identify too. We'll get into the first dinosaur tracks in just a moment. But first, a quick break for our sponsors. The first dinosaur tracks were described fairly early on in 1836 by Edward Hitchcock. He described what he thought were giant bird tracks in the Connecticut River Valley. And they were from the late Triassic. So he kind of linked birds and dinosaurs that way. Hmm. According to the book Trace Fossils, Concepts, Problems, Prospects, Hitchcock was, quote, a man for all seasons. <laughs> <laughs> what does that mean? It means he did a lot of things. He was a clergyman. He was a teacher, a scientist, an administrator, uh, meaning a principal of a couple schools, plus an author must be an alternative meaning of seasons unless it's like you do the science in the summer the teaching in the winter (laughs) the administration in the fall the clergy in the spring (laughs) i had the same thought but then i was thinking maybe he's a seasoned person Mm -hmm. in his first description of the tracks he described seven species the largest one was a natural cast of what he named orinithic nites giganteus Later, that track, though, was renamed to Eubrontes Giganteus, which is the first dinosaur track to be formally described. It might be why that one comes up so often, too. Yes. And being that it was the first one, 
and it's this three-toed track. A lot of other three-toed tracks were described later, mm-hmm. and if you couldn't find a distinguishing feature from Ubrantes, it gets called Ubrantes. <laughs> so it's a bit of a wastebasket tax. A little bit, I think so. A Hitchcock collected many footprints and trackways, and the collection is now at the Pratt Museum Amherst College. He worked there, so that makes sense. His contributions really helped develop ichnology as a science. Though he's not the first person to study tracks, he's known as the father of vertebrate ichnology. The same year that he described the tracks, Hitchcock also wrote a poem, The Sandstone Bird. It was published in the Knickerbocker magazine under the pseudonym Poetaster, meaning a mediocre writer of verse. The poem is about a sorceress who brings the great sandstone bird back to life, and it might be the first ichnological poem. If that name sounds familiar, the sandstone bird, it is featured on paleo poems, and we interviewed the people behind paleo poems in episode 420. Okay, I was wondering if it was part of the paleo poems. It's, it did sound vaguely familiar to me. <laughs> mm-hmm. There's a little bit of a feud or controversy around these tracks from the Connecticut Valley. In the first paper on the tracks, Hitchcock credited James Dean as the one to bring the tracks to his attention, but the two of them had a dispute about who found the first tracks and realized just how important they were. Hitchcock tried to ease the tension with a story about Pliny Mooney, who Hitchcock said was probably the first person to discover the tracks, but by that he was implying someone can make a discovery without knowing at the time how important the find is scientifically. Moody was a farmer in Massachusetts, and in 1802, plowed up some dinosaur tracks on slabs in his fields. One slab he used as a doorstop to his home for years. (laughs) (laughs) When Moody left for school, the slab was purchased by a Dr. Elihu Dwight. This specimen was known as Noah's Raven, and now it's known to be Anamopus scambus. It's a dinosaur footprint of a small ornithischian. Dwight had this slab for nearly 30 years. And then after Dwight died, in 1839, Hitchcock purchased it for Amherst College. Hitchcock said that in 1834, a Mr. William Wilson bought flagging stones to repair a street from a quarry near Montague and noticed marks that he said were, quote, turkey tracks. He pointed out the marks to one of the gentlemen he was buying the stones from, James Dean, who was interested in them and let Edward Hitchcock know. And then Hitchcock bought them for Amherst College. These are the first tracks, the Connecticut Valley tracks. Dean, however, felt that he had looked at the tracks scientifically and studied them seriously first. And he did publish papers on them, but the first one wasn't published until 1843. And Hitchcock published his paper on them in 1836. That's quite a gap there, seven years. Well... Dean did send casts and a description of the tracks to Benjamin Silliman in 1835. Silliman contacted Hitchcock and asked for his opinion, and Hitchcock asked Silliman to not publish Dean's description until after Hitchcock's paper was completed. Oh, that's not great. That's some of the controversy. Yeah. Dean felt that Hitchcock had implied that if Hitchcock hadn't published on the tracks, the tracks wouldn't have been scientifically studied. So the two went back and forth for a while in their articles, and it sounded A little bit like the Bone Wars that way. (laughs) A little bit of bad blood. Mm. But yeah, scientifically, if you haven't published it, the scientific process goes by the hypothesis testing and then the publishing of your results and other people questioning it and trying alternative hypotheses. So until it's published, it's not really in the scientific record. Although in this case, if he was trying to publish it and they basically intentionally delayed his publication so someone else could get the glory. It's a little unclear what happened there. Yeah, I could see how he could have a claim for the first scientific discovery of it if people are going behind his back to delay his publication. Yeah, but again, it seems very unclear at this point in time what happened. Mm -hmm. Another important find was by American Museum of Natural History collector Roland T. Byrd, who's a, quote, self-made man and one of the last of the specialized fossil collectors. Mm-hmm. And he found the first sauropod tracks in Glen Rose, Texas, from the Cretaceous. He found them in 1939. I didn't realize that Glen Rose track site was found that long ago. I didn't either until I was researching this episode. 
These tracks helped paleontologists figure out more about sauropod behavior, including that sauropods walked on land and didn't need to live in the water or be buoyed by water, and that they didn't drag their tails. So when you say the first sauropod tracks in Glen Rose, Texas, you're not saying the first sauropod tracks that were found in Glen Rose, Texas. You're saying the first sauropod tracks, period. Yes. And that happened to be in Glen Rose, Texas. Yes. Oh, okay. And they informed us a lot about how sauropods lived. Mm Mm-hmm. Now, Bird was an adventurer, just like the other fossil hunters from the AM&H, like Roy Chapman Andrews, Barnum Brown, Walter Granger, Bashford Dean. Bashford Dean? I don't know that name. Maybe in a future episode. Well, he specialized in medieval and modern armor. Okay, that makes sense. (laughs) Maybe not in an upcoming episode. (laughs) (laughs) The bird was eccentric and a hypochondriac. He was ill for most of his life. He often only ate one food at a time, like potatoes, chicken, fish patties, and he would eat that meal for weeks at a time. Sounds like something I would do. (laughs) Should we call you an eccentric? (laughs) I think with my food preferences, I might be a little bit. A bird looked frail, but he was great in the field. And he started fossil hunting for Barnum Brown after he discovered a fossilized skull of Stanocephalosaurus in 1932. That's a large amphibian. And then in the summer of 1934, he was one of the key people collecting sauropods from the late Jurassic in the Morrison Formation. One of his best finds was from the 1938 field season, the footprints at the track site on the Paluxy River near Glen Rose, Texas. So I guess it's technically 1938. They found carnosaur tracks and the sauropod tracks. And the tracks were in good enough shape to put on display at the am age so he went back in 1940 to excavate. And they've got trails of a dozen sauropods and four carnivores. Those excavated slabs weighed more than 80,000 pounds. One slab had two sets of trackways, one set of tracks from a sauropod and the other from a theropod. And the theropod's tracks ran parallel to the sauropod's tracks, and at one point, Quote, the meat eater's tracks take a strange skipping stride or hop, leaving two consecutive right footprints in the mud, end quote. Hmm. A bird thought that the hop in the middle was when the theropod attacked the sauropod and identified it as the attack scenario. But not everyone agrees with this. There's no change of speed indicated in the tracks, no disruption by the landing of the hop, and the missing track after may be just how it was preserved. Yeah. I mean, paleontology is certainly one of those places where just because you're missing something doesn't mean it was never there. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So a missing track could be missing for a lot of reasons. We don't know what we don't know. Mm -hmm. A bird also found other sauropod tracks, including a trackway he thought was from a swimming sauropod. And since then, other swimming sauropod trackways have been described. He also found 23 sauropod trackways heading in the same direction in 1944 and said that they supported gregarious behavior, which was a revolutionary concept at the time. And Bird is recognized as one of the first people to hypothesize that sauropods were in herds. Still debated to this day. Yes. (laughs) But not a novel idea anymore. Yeah. Usually they're depicted as in groups and not solitary, I would say. Mm -hmm. So vertebrate ichnology is big today, partly because of so many great finds in North America. In addition to the tracks in Connecticut and Texas, there's tracks in the Morrison Formation, Marsh described them in 1899, and ankylosaur tracks in the Peace River Valley of Alberta and British Columbia, which was reported by Sternberg in 1932. Yeah, I'm surprised that in the Morrison Formation, because there are so many sauropods there, that Marsh didn't identify any sauropod tracks. Although sauropod tracks are pretty hard to identify since they're, I always think they just look like a giant pothole. (laughs) Roland Bird is credited as the first one to find sauropod tracks. Which would mean that Marsh didn't get credited with finding sauropod tracks, at least not in 1899. Yes. Or really ever, because he was dead by the time the Glen Rose tracks were described. Yes. And then there were ankylosaur tracks in the Peace River Valley of Alberta and British Columbia reported by Sternberg in 1932. 
And like you said, with trace fossils, there's so much more than tracks, and we will get into that. But because there's so much cool stuff to talk about, this is a two-parter episode. So for the rest of this episode, we're just going to focus on tracks. Tracks are very useful. They can tell us about battles, herding behaviors, predators following prey. They can show if an animal had four legs, two legs, or if it dragged its tail when walking. For dinosaurs, there are no tail marks that have been left, that have been found, so they didn't drag their tails. One example in terms of behaviors, there's a trackway made by six dromaeosaurs in what is now Shandong province in China from about 120 to 100 million years ago. They were all moving in the same direction. We don't know for sure if they were there together, but there are ripple marks that show that the trackways were covered shortly after they were made, so it seems likely that they were walking together, and maybe that's a sign of pack behavior. The raptors hunting in packs Mm -hmm. hypothesis. It's one of my favorites. We can also use footprint and trackway measurements to estimate limb length. For example, in 2021, Pablo Navarro Lorbez and others found two theropod trackways from the early Cretaceous in what is now Spain. And based on the size of the footprints, the first set of footprints were nearly 13 inches or 33 centimeters long and almost 12 inches or about 30 centimeters wide. And the second set were... 11.4 inches or almost 29 centimeters long and 10.6 inches or almost 27 centimeters wide. So just like 10% smaller, basically. Yeah. So they estimated that the dinosaurs, based on these footprints, were around 7 feet or 2 meters tall and around 13 to 16 feet or 4 to 5 meters long. They were also able to estimate their speed based on the dinosaurs' hip heights and stride lengths. And it turns out these are some of the fastest known theropod tracks. They moved up to 27.7 miles per hour or 44.6 kilometers per hour. They could also tell when their speeds accelerated or decelerated. And the second trackway shows abrupt speed changes, which suggest that this was a maneuvering dinosaur, as the authors put it. Hmm. Yeah, that's cool. I know one of the big things there is how far apart the tracks are. Mm Mm-hmm in terms of how fast they're going. And from tracks, we can also tell if the land was dry or wet. For example, a study from 2020 found that during the early Jurassic mass extinction, about 183 million years ago, there were still some habitable areas at times based on tracks. At that time, the ocean waters were getting warmer, there were more wildfires and toxic gases in the air, and due to volcanic activity, there were a lot of lava flows. These tracks were found in the Karoo Basin, mostly in South Africa, and they show a two-legged carnivorous dinosaur, a four-legged herbivorous ornithischian dinosaur, and a small synapsid, that's the group of reptiles that mammals evolved from. I don't know if i call synapsids reptiles, but yeah. Reptile-like oh. <laughs> animals. Fair point. I was focused on the dinosaur tracks. Mm-hmm. <laughs> now, the carnivore was trotting. The ornithischian was maybe trotting at first, and then it broke into a run. But it wasn't being chased by the carnivore because the carnivore was going in the opposite direction. They also found ripple marks and some desiccation cracks in the sandstone, which means that moisture levels were fluctuating. So it seems that these dinosaurs or these animals were walking through a temporary stream that could have been from a flash flood or seasonal flow or just during a rainy period. Now, there's evidence of burning trees and lava, but in between eruptions, that area would have been habitable, though eventually where the animals walked was covered by more lava. So there's like an eruption, some horrible stuff happens, the animals leave for a little bit and then they come back. (laughs) Yep. And repeat. So they had some moments of peace, it seems. We can also use track sites to conduct census studies about how many animals were in the area, how diverse were they, their geographic ranges, and how things changed over time. As an example, in 2023, Dustin Stewart and others found what they called a coliseum of dinosaur tracks in Alaska from the late Cretaceous. There was a lot of tectonic activity since then, so everything is folded and tilted at a more than 70-degree angle. 
the rock formation is multi-layered. It's about 217 feet or 66.3 meters tall. It's one of those walls of tracks. Yeah, <laughs> the cliff face of tracks. Mm -hmm. So if there's a track 200 feet up in the air on that 70 degree tilt, it's pretty hard to study. It is. They use drones. Okay. I was going to say, unless you use <laughs> a quadcopter or something. There's at least 1,700 tracks from this area. It's possible the tracks were made near a watering hole on a large floodplain. The most common tracks were from ornithopods, but there were also ceratopsian and theropod tracks, including from a medium-sized tyrannosaurid and birds. It's heavily trampled in some areas, so it's likely the hadrosaurs and ceratopsids traveled in herds. Hmm. I was thinking when you said that there was the carnivore and the ornithischian going in opposite directions, so we don't think the carnivore was following the ornithischian. Mm -hmm. I bet if they happened to be facing the same direction, but had gone at the same time periods, everyone would think that it was following it. Yes. <laughs> Even though it still wasn't. It just, you know, we can tell it wasn't because they're going opposite directions, but it's hard to not jump to that conclusion when they are facing the same direction. Mm -hmm. It's just a plausible scenario. Mm -hmm. We'll talk about types of dinosaur tracks in a moment, but first, we're going to take a quick break for our sponsors. Although we can't tell exactly what animal made a specific track in most cases, you can tell what types of dinosaurs made tracks. So theropods, for example, have three toes, and you can tell a theropod left a three-toed track, some sort of theropod. Well, sometimes they get mixed up with ornithopods because they also have three toes. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> but just... This is uh, your starting point. It gives you a hint of where to where to start. Mm -hmm. And the there's differences between the angles of the toes, and sometimes you can see bigger claws on the theropod tracks are another clue. Mm -hmm. uh, Ceratopsian tracks have four toes. Stegosaurs had three toes, and Kylosaurs had three or four. And Kylosaurs had longer toes than Ceratopsians and walked with their palms flat on the ground. Sauropods, of course, had the largest tracks. Uh, how did you describe them? As potholes? Yeah. <laughs> That's really what they look like. Whenever I've seen tracks sort of outlined in any peer review publication or in person, it's like, oh, I can see those three-toed tracks. I can see these four-toed tracks. I can see these five-toed tracks. And then it's the sauropod, which technically has four or five toes, but it's you don't see it. It's just this big old pit. <laughs> I think sometimes you could tell there, there are five toes. Someone can tell. I can't tell. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, these tracks are wide. They're circular. With the five toes, they also had claws on their hands, often only on the thumb. The feet usually had only three claws. Sometimes only sauropod hands are found, and that could be from the ground that they were walking on or how their weight was distributed, or it could be signs of swimming. Just a quick note it can be hard to tell if a dinosaur was swimming. In 2019, James Farlow and others studied a site with at least 52 sauropod tracks. These are the Glen Rose Formation in Texas. The tracks were in limestone in an aquatic environment. They think that it was a closed lagoon at the time based on algae and aquatic fossils also found. And it kind of looked like they were swimming. There was more weight that seemed to be on the front legs. They took a broken piece of the track to study, and they compared the pace of tracks to tracks with hind feet. But their conclusion was that most likely these dinosaurs were not swimming, but they did say they can't fully rule it out. And interestingly, either way, the dinosaur that made these tracks was front heavy with longer forelimbs. Maybe it was kicking off the bottom of the lagoon, or it was walking with more weight on the front legs. One of the track makers may even be a new type of dinosaur, which could explain its strange gait or strange tracks that it left. Yeah, because that sounds more like a brachiosaur type situation where the, the front legs are getting more of the weight. Mm -hmm. That would have been really funny if the Glen Rose tracks, which you said were really good evidence that dinosaurs didn't have to swim and didn't have to live in aquatic environments, oh, yeah. <laughs> turned out to be like... But in that case, they were all aquatic <laughs> tracks. <laughs> that would be funny. <laughs> so 
how can you tell if you found a track? Well, in 2022, Jens Lalensack and others came up with four criteria for verifying that what you're looking at is a track. One is the preservation of regular trackway morphology. This shows the difference in the feet and the hands and alternating foot placement. Two is the preservation of track morphology. Uh, this corresponds with what we know about a dinosaur's anatomy. Well, any animal's anatomy. Also looking for consistency in multiple tracks. Three is the deformation structure. Tracks are made by feet interacting with substrate, the ground, and the feet deform the substrate. That's how they've made their mark. And four, temporal and environmental context. The tracks have to make sense for the time period and place based on the sediment and formation that they're in. I think that's one of the keys to finding a sauropod track. Because it's like, <laughs> there's this big, large circle impression in a place where there were sauropods. <laughs> so if it's from the you know Triassic or something, it's probably not a sauropod track. Maybe it's just a big hole in the ground. Yes. Or how we know that William Buckland wasn't quite right with this tortoise tracks because mm -hmm. there were no tortoises around that time those tracks were made. <laughs> in terms of how tracks are made, the gist is that an animal will push its hand or foot into the ground and leave a print. Uh, often the animal has stepped in soft mud, and then that impression or print gets covered in loose sand that fills it in, and the tracks need to get baked by the sun. The sand consolidates into sandstone, and then eventually the rock splits open to reveal the footprint. Yep, and sometimes depending on what is stepped into, you get either the actual print itself preserved, like in that case it would be like the mudstone, or the sandstone, which is the counter slab, or sometimes they call it the natural mold of the track because it's the thing that filled the track and made a mold of it and then ended up fossilizing. Mm -hmm. And you can also get under tracks, which in that example would be like underneath the mud if there was like a clay type soil or something that got pressed and deformed a little bit, but the foot didn't actually touch it. It just sort of like mushed down the under layer a little bit. That can fossilize and sometimes the other layers get lost. So you're just left with sort of this faint impression of a track from beneath where the track actually was. And that's why you have to be careful about whatever you find. Mm-hmm. And then sometimes the tracks are in unexpected places today. Like we mentioned that Coliseum in Alaska, which is nearly vertical. There are also tracks in Bolivia that are on a wall. The Cal Orco fossil bed, which has nine levels of dinosaur tracks in the El Molino formation. And the main level of tracks is almost vertical. This site has over 12,000 tracks <laughs> in 465 trackways. And nine types of tracks have been found, from theropods, ornithopods, and chylosaurs, sauropods. Uh, the geology has changed and the ground has been pushed up, but when the tracks were made, it was a riverbed. Yeah, that I think is the most impressive sounding track site we've ever heard of. Yes. There are a couple others that I think have reported over 10,000 tracks. I think there's one in Canada, but... This one, I think being on that cliff face makes it even more impressive just mm -hmm. because it's almost like a monument to dinosaur tracks <laughs> <laughs> in a way. Although I know they have a problem with the cliff face sort of eroding off and pieces falling off. You have to wear hard hats if you go there. Oh. But the interesting thing is sometimes a piece falls off and then there's another track underneath it. <laughs> so it, it's kind of helpful almost. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> As long as you can keep documenting it and, you know, get all that information. But it's sort of a difficult spot to get to. I think, though, if you're really into dinosaur tracks, it's one of those, like, bucket list spots oh, yeah. to get to. It's on our list. We've gone through a few examples of what tracks can tell us, and I've got a few more. Couldn't help myself. <laughs> so in 2022, Jens Lalensack and others were able to tell that sauropods did not walk like giraffes based on footprints. They looked at the timing and spacing of footfalls of three trackways in Arkansas in the U.S. Now, past studies had found that sauropods had a gait. The way it walked was kind of like giraffes, where the right legs or the left legs moved at the same time. But for a sauropod, which has this wide gauge, 
there's a risk of falling over because they're so heavy, and if they fell, they would probably die. Or at least get injured. Yes. So it seems like they should have moved differently to stay more stable. The team found that sauropods walked like beavers and hedgehogs. Hmm. They moved the front right and back left legs at the same time, and then moved the front left and back right legs. This is called a diagonal couplet pattern, and it is different from giraffes, where giraffes move both the right legs or both the left legs at the same time. And it's also different from elephants, which move by lifting each foot one by one. Yeah, and different than some sprinting animals that sort of do them in a circle, like they go right front, right back, left back, left front. So they're sort of going like clockwise <laughs> or <laughs> counterclockwise. I can't remember which direction it goes, but they go in a circle. In this case, it's diagonal at the same time. That's interesting. Yeah. There's also evidence of dinosaurs in groups or herds. There's even evidence of tyrannosaurs walking alongside each other. A study in 2014 found three trackways in British Columbia, Canada from tyrannosaurs walking in the same direction at a normal pace of about 5.2 miles per hour or 8.5 kilometers per hour. So it's possible that these tyrannosaurs happen to pass the same spot at different times over a short period of time, but the authors thought that that was unlikely. And then in 2019, Lita Shing and others found hundreds of sauropodomorph tracks that likely shows that the sauropodomorphs were social. There were at least 260 tracks. This is in Guizhou province, China. And the tracks were almost parallel to each other, so it seems like they were walking alongside each other. There's also that picket wire track site in Colorado that shows a few sauropods that, that seem to be kind of parallel. Mm -hmm. And I remember there's one that looks more like a juvenile, much smaller tracks than oh, the others. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I like the studies that show that there was some kind of juvenile with the adults. Mm -hmm. Tracks can also tell us a little bit about predation. So in 2023, scientists found two new bird tracks that seem to show evidence of a raptorial bird preying on another animal. And this is possibly the first evidence of that via a trace fossil. The paper was published in Quaternary Science Reviews. The tracks were found in Portugal. They're from the late Pleistocene from about 129,000 to 11,700 years ago. So recent. Very recent. <laughs> <laughs> Compared to what we normally talk about. Mm -hmm. Again, these are raptorial birds, so dinosaurs, but, you know, avian ones. Mm -hmm. The first trackway is named Corvid Ichnis Odomirensis. And they attributed those tracks to the movement of a western jackdaw, also known as a Corvus mondula. The second trackway is named Bubo Ichnis Vicentinus. And they interpreted that as a predatory feeding trace of a Eurasian eagle owl, the Bubo Bubo. That's a fun one to say. That is. Multiple eagle owl tracks come together with two converging tracks of shorebirds, and that shows the eagle owl actively catching and going after prey. Not something you think that you would see like tracks of, because I always think birds swoop down to catch their prey or snatch it off the ground or something like that, not run over to it. Mm hmm I feel like you have to have a good eye to notice these kinds of activities within oh, yeah. a track. That's true. And even to notice the tracks, because like owls or eagle owls do not leave particularly large tracks. Mm -hmm. It's not like a sauropod. You could like hurt yourself on the thing. <laughs> <laughs> Again, we'll talk about even more trace fossils in next week's episode, including burrows, eggs, tooth marks, and fossilized poop. So stay tuned. But now, it's time for the dinosaur of the day. So now for our dinosaur of the day, Talon Kauan, which was a request from Tyrant King via our Patreon and Discord. So thanks. Talon Kauan was an iguanodont that lived in the late Cretaceous in what is now Santa Cruz Province, Argentina, in the Cerro Fortaleza Formation. 
It was similar to Dryasaurus, but slightly larger and with a proportionally longer neck. It had a long tail, shorter arms than legs, a small head, and it was small and it walked on two legs. It was estimated to be about 13 feet or 4 meters long, though Gregory Paul estimated it to be 15 feet or 4.7 meters long, and to weigh 660 pounds or 300 kilograms. It had a relatively small head and a slender humerus or upper arm bone. The humerus had reduced areas for muscle attachment, like other ornithopods found in South America, such as Nodohypsilophodon and Ana bisetia. Talancauan had teeth at the tip of its beak, and it had a first toe, which is unlike later iguanodontians, that they only had the three middle toes. Yeah, and the teeth in the beak. I feel like we're always talking about toothless beaks. Yeah. <laughs> it almost always precedes beak, toothless beak. <laughs> but not in this case. Tala and Kauan also had smooth egg-shaped plates on the side of the rib cage that were long. They were seven inches or 180 millimeters, but thin. They were only three millimeters thick. Oh, weird. Mm-hmm. Other dinosaurs have similar plates like Hypsilophodon and Thescalosaurus. In this case, though, these plates were too thin to help with defense. Mm-hmm. I wonder if it's one of those where they could have been used as like a calcium store kind of thing. Oh, maybe. We're not really sure at this point. Tal and Kauan, the fossils were found in 2000. The type species is Tal and Kauan Santa Crucensis. It was named from a relatively complete articulated skeleton that's missing just the back of the skull, the tail, and the hands. And it was described in 2004 by Fernando Novas and others. The genus name means small skull, and the species name refers to the province where it was found. Do you know what language it means, small skull in? The Talan Kauan? It's from the Tehuelche language. Oh, cool. Yeah, we've talked about some animals named after that. They're the native group that's down in like southern Chile and Argentina. Mm hmm. And up in the Andes. Yeah. There were also bone fragments and teeth found near the holotype, which are likely from a recently hatched Talan Kauan. So it was the first hatchling ornithopod discovered in the southern hemisphere. It had some wear on its teeth too, which means it had eaten and it had hatched. It wasn't an embryo. It was out in the world. Hmm. It's possible that the adult took care of the baby, but it's unclear. Other dinosaurs that lived around the same time and place as Talancauan include the Titanosaur, Puertosaurus, and the theropod Orcoraptor. And our fun fact for this week is a recap of something we talked about in a previous episode. But don't worry, I have a little bonus information. Mm -hmm. And it's that figuring out what dinosaurs left specific tracks is incredibly difficult, but AI can help solve the mystery. In 2022, Jens Lowensack and others solved this big mystery of tracks in Queensland, Australia, in the Lark Quarry, the Dinosaur Stampede National Monument. And these tracks were made about 95 million years ago. They had three toed tracks, and it was unclear if they were made by theropods or ornithischians. Just like you were saying earlier, Garrett, how both of these types of dinosaurs had three toes, and sometimes it's hard to tell. Mm hmm. Yeah, I think I was saying specifically the ornithopod ornithischians often have really similar <laughs> three toed footprints, but. Yes. Now, in this case, Depending on whether it was made, the tracks were made by theropods or ornithischians, that tells us a much different story of what happened at that site. Mm hmm. Was it a stampede? Yes. Why were they stampeding? Exactly. What makes it tricky is that ornithischian tracks tend to be wider, more symmetric, and have blunt hoof marks instead of sharp claw marks, but these characters can be seen in both groups of tracks. So to help figure out which track belonged to which group, the team trained this artificial neural network to categorize footprints as theropod or ornithischian. They used about 1,500 dinosaur footprints where we knew that they were from ornithischian and theropods to train the network. And then they tested to see how well it worked on a set of 36 tracks that was a mix of obvious and challenging tracks to figure out. 
Five researchers also looked at the same tracks and were asked to identify them. And the AI did a better job at figuring out which tracks were which. There was a margin of error of about 11%. It classified 67% correctly, 22% ambiguous, and 11% incorrectly. But the five researchers averaged 57% correctly, 24% ambiguous, and 20% incorrectly. I remember talking about this at the time and asking, how do we know what's correct versus incorrect? And I think it was like, there's a series of tracks, and then there's one that's like not so good, mm -hmm. and that's the one that they ask on. Yes. <laughs> it's like, we can tell because, you know, they're in a group, but let's give them the bad one and see, <laughs> test the AI and the people. Yeah, it's a good way to test. It's interesting to me that it was more accurate both in classifying them, but also in not like false positives and false negatives mm -hmm. were better because it only got 11% of them wrong versus 20% for people, but then it got 67% of them right versus 57% by people. Mm -hmm. And it had less ambiguous ones as well. Yeah, so it was definitely helpful. Still not a slam dunk though. It's not, but it's a starting point. <laughs> Getting a 67% on a test isn't <laughs> real great. But I think that's what you said the last time we talked about yeah. this, yeah. Better than a 57%. We're grading <laughs> on a curve here, so the AI came out ahead. Oh, well, okay. What the AI found was, I mean, this, so it's called Dinosaur Stampede National Monument. And there's these big tracks surrounded by a lot of small footprints. So in the past, it was thought that there's a predator that sparked a stampede. And maybe the predator was Australovenador. That's the, what they went with for the Australian Age of Dinosaurs Museum display. They have an Australovenador sort of chasing a bunch of little herbivorous dinosaurs. Yes, I do really like that display. Mm -hmm. But the AI found that the tracks were made by an ornithischian, an herbivore. So there probably wasn't a stampede. It was something else going on here. It could still be a stampede, though. Ornithischians, not all herbivores are friendly. True. It could be an herbivore that was unhappy with all these little baby dinosaurs <laughs> in its space. <laughs> Get maybe, out of my way. Maybe it was too close to its babies. Who knows what? <laughs> so maybe eventually we'll figure out what really happened or get a better idea at least. As a bonus, though, it's not just AI that's helping figure out what animals made certain footprints. There's other technology like CT scanning and photogrammetry that really help. Tom Holtz talked about this at Virtual SVP in 2023 and how, for example, the Paluxy tracks in Texas and the U.S. seem to match Acrocanthosaurus, cool. the theropod ones. Yeah, I hope in the future we can match more dinosaur tracks with the known dinosaurs because... It's always more interesting when you can look at a track. Everybody always asks that, right? Like, what made that track? And it's a little unsatisfying to say, some kind of theropod, probably, maybe an ornithischian. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but if you could say Acrocanthosaurus, that's a lot more fun. It is. And that wraps up this week's episode. If you enjoyed this episode or our other episodes, then please consider leaving us a review in Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to your podcast. Stay tuned. Next week, we'll be going into part two of our trace fossils episode, which will include burrows, teeth marks, and of course, that fossilized poop. Hmm. Thanks again, and until next time. 